um, heard Frances give her talk, um, her tour, that you have already met her and know that she has, this is a project, a lifelong project um, shot in Alabama. But I'm going to do a little commercial in the fact that we have a goodly number of her books on sale for the very special price of $50. It originally retailed for $69, I think, yeah. was it? Yeah. So it's your price special today. If you'd like it, you can see me with credit cards or um, the book bookstore, which um, I urge you to visit anyway. Um, and I also want to um, thank the Altamont students who are here, some of them, today, and um, their professors, Andrew Nelson and Mary Gray Hunter, who um, helped coordinate with this project, and also our donor, Lucy Hicks, who is also here, and who brought her sister's homemade cheese straws for <laughs> us for afterwards. <laughs> I think Frances really doesn't need any um, more introduction other than say she's a Birminghamian, this is her library, and we are very happy to welcome her here this afternoon. Thank you, Olivia. I want to give a special thanks to the library staff, a lot of whom are sort of invisible at this meeting, but who are very, very important in putting on this display. We're hoping that the pictures here will go as a group to other libraries in the Jefferson County, Birmingham system. And if you have any connection with the library that's not this main library, where you're, you think the pictures would be appropriate, let us know about it and we'll make arrangements for it to come to you. Um, I started this project in 1988 when I was working on an exhibition of Alabama landscape photographs. That was a jump off a cliff. I was new to re be back in Alabama after an absence of about 20 years and I had no idea if there were any pictures out there or not. Uh, I suspected that there were because I'd never been anywhere where I hadn't seen some interesting photographs, but I didn't really know until I started looking. And when I started looking, treasures appeared. The show was enthusiastically received. A lot of the museums that held it had record attendance for the months or the weeks that the show was on, and it inspired me to continue studying Alabama photography. Through the years I have been a consultant to a lot of projects, including some here at this library. The one I'm most proud of is the Common Bonds, the Common Grounds. It was a wonderful exhibition that showed how if you hand two people a camera, they're going to take somewhat similar pictures. And that commonality is what binds our city photographically when it didn't bind our city, when our city was torn and riven in such distress for so long. The city is so different from the city I grew up in, I cannot tell you. It is an absolute pleasure to be here instead of the sort of daunting uh, atmosphere that I had found when I was growing up. And having been a absolute aficionado of Tallulah Bankhead and having appreciated her show on the radio, the big show, where she for the first time in a radio variety show showcased black entertainers, I was absolutely flabbergasted to realize that our city was becoming the city that Tallulah would have liked to have lived in. So with no further ado, I'm going to show you some pictures from the show, and I'm going to tell you about the stories that they represent. Pictures do not live without words, and being able to put a title on a picture, to be able to put a number date on it, all of that stuff that librarians call metadata, to me that's subject matter, and it is the beginning of a story being told. Could we lower that projector just a little bit, do you think? Yeah. Um, this is the cover of my book, and it does not show Birmingham. 
Too bad. It shows the city at the eastern edge of the Birmingham Industrial District. So I count it as part of Birmingham because I grew up thinking that Birmingham stretched from Anniston and Gadsden to Tuscaloosa. And everything in between was Birmingham. Uh, this is a picture that just screamed to be on the cover of this book. But I'll tell you, I had a little problem with my editor over that. He looked at it and he said, this doesn't look like Alabama to me. And I said, well, um, what do you think Alabama looks like? Poor people in a bread line? And he almost nodded, but he caught himself before he embarrassed himself by doing that. And I said, when this picture was taken, Alabama was becoming a part of the United States. We had movies that everybody saw across the country. These kids are admirers of not only the movies, but in particular, they're admirers of Rudolph Valentino. And on top of that, they realize their dreams in a way that wouldn't have been possible a generation earlier. Charlotte became a housewife, which is what she wanted to be. Her brother, Frank, took himself off to New York, having saved enough money to live there for six months. He learned how to be a ballroom dancing teacher, are we surprised, and came back to Aniston to teach ballroom dancing for more than 50 years. When I first started giving talks for the Alabama Humanities Foundation, I would give an occasional talk in East Alabama, and when I showed this picture, people would leap up out of the audience and say, I studied dancing with him. I can do the tango. <laughs> And there is a continuity that photography brings to our experience that I delight in. I think that Charlotte has taken her uh, scarf or shawl right off the player piano in the living room. That is a player piano shawl if I ever saw one. And there are many details in this picture that show us that these people are living a fantasy for Frank, it comes true. Now, by the time Birmingham uh, was founded, photography was already a, a bit old. It had come to America in the 1830s. And by the time that Birmingham was founded, pictures like this one, these two, cased photographs, one of a kind, were obsolete. Birmingham was born at a time when paper prints were the photographs of desire. And that lasted until the year 2000 when digital photographs overwhelmed paper prints in popularity. One person who saw the whole spread of life in Birmingham from 1872 until 1925 was the man in these pictures, Alan Christopher Oxford. I'm right now writing a monograph about him because he was Birmingham's first resident photographer and he had opportunities because of the new city uh, that no one else in Alabama had. Uh, next, please. Oh, I'm doing it. Sorry. <laughs> um, for the Philadelphia Centennial in 1876, Oxford was asked to send photographs shown for exhibit there, and I believe that this photograph must have been one of the ones on display. It shows uh, the ironworks at Ironton. Ironton is Oxmoor. So if you've ever been on Oxmoor Road or seen that exit driving past, that's where these works were, on the south side of the mountain. These are among the earliest industrial photographs made in the state. And they're made by a person who was consummate composer of pictures. He could have moved an inch one way or the other, but no further. Another few feet, and there's a different picture. And this is part of a series, some of which are lost, that showed the whole ironworks, the whole, every bit of the works. But Oxford was primarily a portrait photographer. 
his main activity and his main income came from taking portraits. Birmingham's mayor, James Powell, the doer man at the left, was evidently a charmer who could charm the birds off the trees, especially if you had money. He went to New York and Chicago constantly to, to try to acquire investment capital from capitalists to invest in his city. And he took a proprietorial glee in counting up the money that they made. But on the right is a more typical scene. It's a young girl with, in a giant felt shoe with dolls all around her. Someone pointed out to me what I had not grasped, that this is a takeoff on the old woman who lives in a shoe. Had so many children, she didn't know what to do. I didn't, I didn't catch that. Somehow I must have missed it when Mother Goose was being read in my household. But in the 1880s, a lot of photographers thought that photographing children was pretty dull. And so they goosed up their pictures with all kinds of accessories. Oxford among them. I talked a little bit in the gallery outside about this remarkable picture, which is evidently unique. There's not another one like it. It was made by Arthur S. Proctor, a little known photographer in Birmingham. And it shows William Henry Shepherd, the first Presbyterian missionary to the Belgian Congo, pointing to a map of the Congo that shows his uh, mission uh, on it. He's pointing to the, in the direction of the mission. The Presbyterians, not too long ago, renamed some of their uh, units of governance and one of the units that they renamed became the Lapsley and Shepherd whatever unit. And it is still one of the major units of the Presbytery of, of Alabama. It honors a white man named William Lapsley who agreed to take Henry Shepherd with him to the Congo where they would missionize together no sooner had they arrived in Africa than Lapsley died of a fever. And Shepard was left alone to found the mission, to bring it to glory, and to campaign relentlessly against the emperor of the Belgians for uh, assaulting, uh, persecuting, and killing hundreds of thousands of black rubber workers his, he made an international campaign of this and was very successful at it. At the end of his first 10 years in the Congo, he came back to the States to raise money to return and to also to marry his long-awaited fiance who had waited patiently for 10 years for him to come back. And then they went together to the Congo. While Shepard was in the Congo, he rediscovered some major geographical features that had been lost since Arab times and was awarded membership in the Royal Geographic Society of London. He met Queen Victoria because of that and I bet this frock coat was purchased in order to have that royal meeting. He came back to the United States a little bit horrified at conditions here the color line had gone, grown even stronger while he was away. And when he came back, he would oftentimes find himself having dinner with rich uh, Americans who would be seated, sitting in a, a table with a long stretched out uh, into the dining room, chairs all around it, and pushed against a window. On the other side of the window, a small table would accommodate Mr. Shepard alone. So he was with the party, but he was not actually in the room with the other white people. So he did not like this. He preferred the freedom of Africa for all its poverty and all of its difficulties. He had the picture made without any question because he was in Alabama and probably had run out of publicity pictures. Uh, celebrities sold these pictures after their lectures in order to make extra money. They usually sold for a dollar or two, and he would save all that money. And he probably ordered 100 or 200 from Mr. Proctor. 
The other thing that's remarkable about Henry Shepard is that his is one of the three earliest ethnographical collections of the Congo, of Congo artifacts ever. That's it. There are three. The other two were accumulated by white, white, <clears throat> excuse me, white explorers. His was accumulated by a missionary servicing the people who brought him things to keep. Most of his collection is now at Hampton University in Virginia, which he attended. He also attended theological school in Tuscaloosa at what is now Stillman College. Uh, so I was touched by the Tuscaloosa connection and had the opportunity to give my copy of this picture, which is, uh, to my knowledge, unique, to Hull Special Collections at the university, because Stillman had no capacity for taking care of pictures like this. Uh, they're evidently free to borrow it whenever they like. Black people entered the photographic record in Alabama in slavery days, when an occasional white owner would have pictures made of his dependents, his white dependents, his wife and children, and his black dependents, his slaves. Um, but by the 1880s, blacks were moving into photography as they accumulated more income, more disposable income, they were free to, to use that disposable income however they wished, and slowly they entered the photographic record. This photograph was made by James M. Byrd, who, James Byrd was, to my knowledge, the earliest photographer to run a business of photography in Alabama, and he ran it for more than 20 years here in Alabama here in Birmingham. He would not have been able to do that if, Alab if Birmingham had not had such a vicious color bar that compelled black businesses to be established to service black consumers who did not want to, to support white businesses. And so James N. Byrd owes his uh, longevity to a great deal of being in the right place at the right time. This elderly man is undoubtedly one of the more important members of the black community of Birmingham, someone who's being honored by a photograph. In spite of his shabby outfit and the safety pin that's replacing a button, he comes across as dignified and proud and elite. And that's the way you wanted to appear when you had your picture taken. I already have talked at length about this picture, but tomorrow is the day, right? And we can't stay away from football until the day is over. Um, this picture is proof positive, as I said earlier, that if an event is important and there's only one picture of it, no matter how terrible that picture is, it will be reproduced forever. And when I started to track this picture down, I called out different archives, all of which had copies of it, but only one had a copy that was anywhere close to the original. So I'm very pleased at Auburn University for having come through with this one. It's a terrible picture. You can hardly see what's happening. Part of it, as I said earlier, was the bad weather. It was an overcast day. It was in February when dusk comes at 3.30 or 4, and nightfall is at 4.30, but he took the picture anyway. Did he have any idea it was going to be this important? Surely not. Surely somebody who had a passion for the game or who liked baseball and just said, you want to come out and take some pictures of what's happening at our baseball park. Uh, he couldn't have known that it was going to take over America, the sport and particularly that it was going to take over Alabama. But he took it, we have it, and as I say, it's been reproduced countless times. <laughs> this picture, on the other hand, has not been reproduced very often, but it shows a scene that's not very far from Oxmoor, from Ironton, where the furnace was that we saw in the AC Oxford picture. This picture was taken by our second state geologist, Eugene Allen Smith, who roamed the state at three miles an hour in a Studebaker wagon, uh, taking pictures and writing down information about Alabama's geology. 
He realized, as did most of the industrialists of Alabama, that Alabama was only going to recover from the Civil War and Reconstruction if it pulled itself up by its own bootstraps. And in Birmingham's case, the bootstrap was the mineral wealth of this valley. This is Spalding Mine. It's, it shows the ore crusher and trestle on Red Mountain. And up above it, you can see a hole, a sort of square hole that's propped up by timbers. That's an early ore mine. And the, it's being mined to support the industry that's emerging in Alabama. More importantly, Spalding Mine was a kind of a keystone in the struggles of Republic Steel to make a vertical in integration of its industry. That means they would own everything from the mines to the primary processing, to the people who made the pig iron, to the people who turned the pig iron into steel. To, in other words, every element of the process of making steel would be under their direct control. This was the last thing they needed. And this is what they're celebrating on August the 6th, 1901. This is the, the company, Republic, became U.S. Steel. Before that, we knew it here in the city as TCI. So this is a historic picture that even if we haven't seen it before, once we know its story, we're in a position to appreciate it. Now, Birmingham had its share of wonderful photographers, but none, I think, was as daring as O.V. Hunt. I mean, anyone who would put his valuable camera up there on top of a swinging beam and stand there in his shirt sleeves, pretending to take the lens cap off his camera, uh, he's got to be nuts. Or what my husband calls from the, being in the Navy, a, what is it called, crazy brave. This guy's a crazy brave for sure. And so is the guy who's standing there taking the picture, but he's presumably on solid ground on the old Tutwiler Hotel girders that this one is moving into. Ovi Hunt poked his nose into every corner of the Magic City. He took pictures of everything. And I want to show you one that is one of my favorites because I grew up near Inslee, Alabama and attended Inslee High School. Uh, this is a scene that was taken just a block in front of the blast furnaces that are just off to the left in this picture. And it shows trolley car 216 rounding the corner, heading towards Tuxedo Junction, the site of much wonderful music. The details of the picture are not always visible in this kind of light, but I want to draw your attention to the posters that are on the sidewalk, the sidewalk signs. They point to what is happening in the neighborhood here. And what you see are signs for shoe repair. Joseph Pumilia, who ran the shoe repair, came from Italy with his family in the 1890s and started manufacturing shoes. Well, that was not a wise thing to do because there were manufactured shoes being sold very cheaply all over the United States. So pretty soon he went into shoe repair because that was something people did need. Two years after this photograph was made in 1915, Pumilia is no longer living at this site and it's no longer the site of his business. What's he doing? Well, the city directory says he's gone into auto top repair. So remember those Surrey with the fringe on top, early automobiles? He's using the same skills, but he's found something new to do with them and something that's in demand. That's a Birmingham habit. Now, F. Cloud is, is an almost unknown photographer, black photographer, who ran Cloud's studio. He, this is a picture he took of the Bradford Funeral Home, which I just found out to my delight was run by a woman. Isn't that impressive? Uh, she, she took over the reins of the Bradford Funeral Home, redid the interior, acquired that magnificent uh, 
vehicle in the front that's used for carrying caskets and has flower holders down the inside of it to keep the flowers fresh until they get to the funeral. This is one of the most wonderful photographs I have ever seen of Birmingham because it shows a successful business operated by a woman um, that is independent it's not been swept up by a chain of conglomerations, and it's by a black photographer. I couldn't hope for more. On the other hand, blacks were not the only people who were moving into Alabama and coming to terms with the economic life here. Immigrants were pouring in from Russia, from Italy, from all kinds of countries in Europe, and these gentlemen are studying on a very, very hot day for their citizenship exam that would make them full partners in the Birmingham's progress. It's a hot day. They've moved outside to the backyard, and they're in a community center that was begun by the Methodist Church and was heavily subsidized by TCI, which needed all the trained workers it could get but it needed workers who were already, to some extent, Americanized, new American habits, new American ways of life, American ways of work, and that's what this community center was there to do. This archive of pictures of the Inslee Community Center is at Birmingham Southern College in their Methodist archives, and it's, uh, those archives are worth a visit that's a special place. One of the people who interests me most about uh, in Birmingham's photography is a black fellow named Hanson Alston. Hanson Alston worked for a white photographer named A.C. Keeley, Jr. But before that, he had worked for A.C.'s father, A.C. Sr. And when A.C.'s father died, when A.C. Jr. was only 18, Hanson Alston took him in hand and taught him everything he knew about photography, which was considerable because, because uh, Alston had run the dark room, had done the setups for shoots, had done all kinds of photographic printing. He really knew what he was doing. The only book on photography that was in Birmingham that A.C. Jr. could find to read was at the Birmingham Public Library. <laughs> uh, we are very pleased that he evidently read it and with Austin's help managed to understand what the terms were that were being used in the book. This shows Austin outside the dark room with the rubber uh, apron he wore. Austin's story is not always a po completely a positive one. When the depression really hit bottom, Keeley had to let Alston go. Alston had been moonlighting for a while before that, going out into the um, mining camps near Jefferson, well, in Jefferson County and Walker County, and taking pictures of the black camper, the black miners there. Then he'd take them, go into town, develop them on his own time during the week, and take them back out there the following week to get his pay and to share the pictures. Uh, so he was probably better equipped than most to make some kind of a living, but he disappears from the Birmingham directories in 1940, and we have no idea what happened to him. Against this picture of immigrants coming in was a picture of a group of people who just as soon have immigrants go out. Uh, the KKK, which was revived in uh, the United States in 1915, and by the 1920s had a stranglehold on the city of Birmingham, with probably more people belonging, belonging to the Klan than didn't. Uh, this is a picture taken by a very enigmatic photographer. We don't even know his first name. His last name is St. John. And he took KKK pictures all over the state. Um, this one shows a rally of Birmingham's own clavern, the, Bedford, the Nathan Bedford Forest Clavern. It was probably taken at Rickwood Field, which would be the largest outdoor field of its day that could accommodate such a, a gathering. 
And this is a detail. The picture itself goes across and encompasses many, many more people. I would say twice as many Klansmen are shown. <laughs> At this point, the Klan is in power. They don't care who sees them. They don't care who watches their ceremonies. The ceremonies are meant to be watched, and they're meant to be intimidating. I've already talked about the FSA photographs, so I won't belabor them, except to say that Birmingham had a third of its people had no jobs, and another third worked part-time. That tells the story right there, and that picture was not going to change, except to get worse because of the influx of people who came in from tenant farming and sharecropping had been thrown off the farm and had lost their p jobs because either the farm went defunct or because uh, if the owners were wealthy enough, tractors replaced the manpower. This one we've already talked about also. And this one I have to linger on for just one more moment. This was taken on 25th Street, just over there, where the projects were for so many years that replaced these derelict slums. Peter Sicare was escaping from an unhappy family when he migrated to the United States. He, he and Walker Evans became friends, and Walker Evans left Peter in New York to finish printing up a portfolio of prints for the Museum of Modern Art, while Walker Evans made his first trip south. Uh, they remained friends, and Peter Sicare later joined Walker Evans, and they toured through some of the South, including Alabama. He took remarkable pictures in, in Anniston, and then this breathtaking one of two women on a porch, a modern Martha and Mary, uh, one of them doing the labor, the other one reading the Birmingham News. Snapshots are one of my favorite things to look at, and this little girl running toward the photographer has to be special. Uh, snapshots are taken in the moment. They're not posed, they're not sorted out, they're not cleaned up. They're just shot by somebody who is interested in being there and in showing someone else what it's like to be there. This little girl is running toward the photographer not a studio photographer that she's never met before, but someone she's intimately familiar with. And even better, the scene is taking place in a yard. It's not taking place in a studio, but it's taking place in a location where most Birmingham families spent their leisure time. <coughs> a wonderful picture. This one is very touching. Both of these come from the um, the Birmingham Public Library archives and were part of the Common Grounds Bonds, the Common Bonds show. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to hang around in kibitz while the picture selection was made for the exhibition. The pictures were all wonderful. It's just that a few were more wonderful than others, and they're the ones that made it to the exhibition, which was, in my view, a showstopper and a never before, all at once. Uh, this picture was taken for a GI who was overseas fighting the war. He was afraid he might not get home to have a picture of his mother. There weren't any pictures because there weren't any cameras in his neighborhood. And it was very common in most Birmingham neighborhoods. There were no cameras until the 1950s. This is anecdotal, but I've talked to everybody I know and they all say, oh, no, we didn't get a camera till, oh, somebody brought one home from the war. Uh, in the 1950s, we were better off so we could afford to buy a brownie. Um, this picture was taken with a camera that was bought for the purpose of taking this picture and then shared with the Birmingham Public Library. It's, it's just a picture. And at the same time, the story it tells is very rich. Now, this is me. I'm there on the left, the little girl that's grinning, and my sister who's looking up waiting for Santa Claus to come is my older sister. We were taken here in the first full year of the war uh, in our um, V for Victory outfits with our V for Victory sign. 
We were wearing red, white, and blue sweaters knitted by my Aunt Dee Dee. And we were holding a V for Victory sign that has ivy or has, excuse me, holly on it from our holly bushes that was applied to it by my Aunt Dee Dee. She wanted us to be patriotic. My parents agreed that that was the right tone to set for our Christmas card. Before that, we had held wreaths and candles and all that kind of Christmassy stuff. But this, my aunt felt, called for something special. So this picture is now with others like it. From the, I have a whole series of these pictures. It's now at the State Archives, where uh, I'm hoping that somebody enjoys looking at these little girls come Christmas. Now, there are still things that I would like to know about Alabama photography <laughs> and about Birmingham photography. Um, I've only scratched the surface. I only know 200,000 photographs. I don't know what really is out there, but I know that I have only scratched the surface. But there are questions that are in my mind that I ponder. One of them is, who put the baby in the punch bowl? <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Anybody have comments or questions? What did you like? Hmm? Well, thank you.